Good morning. Good morning. Can you all hear me all the way back? Oh, it's wonderful. Wonderful, wonderful, wonderful. I wouldn't have you think for a minute <clears throat> that the work we are starting is an easy one. The Master says that the way is straight and narrow, and few there be that enter. And every one of us should remember that passage frequently. Few there be that enter. There's a reason for that fewness. And the fewness is in the difficulty. What is so difficult about this work? We have learned in the last two days that there are no evil powers. There are no evil powers anywhere in heaven or on earth or in hell beneath the earth. All power is in God. All power is God. Why then this difficulty? Why so few that can enter? Why so few that can be practitioners, that is successful practitioners? And the reason lies in that one statement that the natural man receiveth not the things of God. Generations upon generations have built up a human consciousness. A consciousness that believes there is power in things and in persons. A consciousness that believes it is something separate and apart from God and therefore can be destroyed. What is the one great fear on earth? The only fear, really. Death. No other. Nobody would be afraid of disease if disease couldn't kill. No one, no one would be afraid of age if age didn't lead to death. No one would ever be afraid of an accident if an accident couldn't kill. No one would ever be afraid of a war. No one would ever be afraid of poverty. The only reason we fear these things is because behind all of them lies death. And why do we fear death? Because there is a human consciousness that believes it is something separate and apart from God, and it isn't. Your consciousness and mine, the consciousness of every individual, is eternal. It is immortal. It is not subject to death. We not only do not know that, but even after we are taught that in metaphysics, we cannot accept it or believe it. Why? Because the human mind cannot accept anything greater than itself. And the human mind is itself a state of death. Limitation. Finiteness. The moment the human mind comes in contact with spiritual truth, that moment the human mind starts dying. As soon as, as human awareness, human consciousness is touched by the divine, human consciousness starts dying. 
full tells us about dying daily. The human selfhood, left to itself, <coughs> will live out a human span Sometimes that human span is only one year in length. In some cases, as these boys in war, it may be 17, 18, 19, 20, 21. Left to itself, it'll go on to uh, 60, 70, 80 years of age. And all of a sudden, it fades out. But human consciousness, touched by the divine, This human consciousness, touched by the divine, begins to die at the moment of its contact with spiritual wisdom. But the dying is difficult. It will not yield itself quickly. It will not give itself up quickly. It has taken thousands of years to form, and it does not readily yield. I want to see what this human mind accepts. In the first place, if you look into a mirror, you will say to yourself, I do not look too well, or I am aging or I am too stout, or I am too thin. And you see right there, you have made the fatal mistake. Because the word I is God. And when you look in the mirror, you're not seeing yourself at all, you're seeing your body. That isn't you standing there. That is your body. You are invisible. No one has ever seen you. You have never seen yourself. Your mother has never seen you. You are invisible. Your body, or at least some concept of your body, is visible. But not even your body really is visible. Not the body of you. It is only our finite concept of your body that is visible, and that is why your body keeps changing. Whereas, in truth, your body never changes. Only this concept that we entertain of body changes, like our concept of wealth changes. If we look at our orange grove full of oranges, we consider that we are wealthy. And when we see the same orange grove after a good windstorm, we think that we are poor. Whereas wealth is invisible. Just as I am invisible and you are invisible, so no one on the face of the earth has ever seen wealth. No one has ever seen supply. That is why all of this metaphysical attempt to demonstrate supply ultimates in failure. It is true, 30 years ago, there was a flourishing New Thought movement in America based on demonstration. You could demonstrate everything from getting rid of corn to acquiring a thousand dollars. But where is that uh, New Thought movement today? 90% of it has vanished into thin air. Very little of it is left on the face of the earth. And the same has happened in England, where also 30 years ago it was a tremendous flourishing movement. And today there are just the last faint gasps of it as it disappears from the scene. Why? Because the New Thought movement was based on demonstration. Getting and getting rid of. Getting rid of and getting. 
No. It isn't possible to get rid of, and it isn't possible to get. It isn't possible to demonstrate anything on the face of the globe. It isn't possible to demonstrate any condition. All of these were metaphysical fallacies that have more or less dropped out of sight and uh, exist today only through artificial respiration. A little life is being pumped into the movement here and there that keeps it temporarily alive while some of the old, old teachers still exist. When the last of those is gone, the last of the New Thought movement will have gone too. Why? Because its basic premise is erroneous. Now, why is its basic premise erroneous? Because it looks upon you and me as man, as an effect, as something separate from God, and therefore as something which can acquire qualities, activities of God. And so it sets out to help us acquire, get, achieve, these things of God. The premise is wrong because the word I is God. Because the word I is being now. Infinite being, eternal being, immortal being. And I am that being. Because I am that being, nothing can be added to that which I am. And nothing has ever been taken from that which I am. And all attempts then to add to that which I am must end in failure because all that the Father hath already is mine. All that the Father hath already is mine because I and the Father are one, not two. We are not something separate and apart from God, seeking to get God or get things of God. I and the Father are one. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. These are not statements in a book. This is a revelation of eternal truth. This is the truth of being revealed originally by the Krishna, the original uh, Christ in consciousness, revealed somewhere on earth as a man, uh, revealed again uh, by the same Christ through the man Christ Jesus. Revealed over and over and over again uh, through time. And always lost. Always lost it's always lost in the same way. Because disciples try to grasp this truth with their mind and memorize it and recite it and declare it and state it and affirm it and then go out to teach it long before they have demonstrated it, long before they have acquired the consciousness of it. And of course, because they only have it in their mind, they can only impart it with their mind, and that's no impartation at all. So that the only time in the face of the globe where this truth has been adequately revealed and taught has been when it has come through the consciousness of one who has attained some measure of it. And those who grasped it were able to hold it. But by far the majority went through a course and got a degree and went out and started teaching. Now then, let us for a moment go through one of our exercises. I say one of our exercises. I guess it's the only exercise we have in the infinite way. 
that may help us to establish our true identity so that we understand it. And then be very certain that you do not tell it to anyone until it has become so real within your own being that you can never lose it. Don't start telling it while it is merely an intellectual acceptance in your mind. Wait until you are demonstrating it in some degree. Now let us look right down at our feet. And let us ask ourselves the question, is this me? Are these feet me or are they mine? Am I down there or do I possess those feet? Let us travel right up to the knee. Am I anywhere in there? Or are those legs mine? Are they mine or are they me? If they are hurt, am I hurt or are my legs hurt? Is there not a me? an identity which is not legs. Let us go up to the waist and see if we can find ourselves and see if all that we behold is not mine. Am I there or is that body mine? Is there not still a me separate and apart from that body? Is there not an I which possesses that body? Is that body not an instrument for my living, for my walking? Let us go right up to the chest, and the neck, and the head, and see if we find ourselves in there. See if all this wasn't given to us for our use, for our locomotion, for our movement, for our activity. See if all this isn't as much ours as our automobile. And all the way right up to the top of the hair on top of the head. And see if you find yourself encased in there. See if you find yourself embodied in any spot in there. See if all of this isn't yours. Isn't this your head, your ears, your eyes, your mouth, your tongue, your throat? Could any of that be me? Or is all of that mine? And then review from the toes right up to the hair. And again ask yourself, am I there? Am I encased in there? Has a surgeon ever operated and found anyone in there? Is there anyone inside there to escape from there? Am I in there that I could someday go some other place? Can I leave this body? First, am I in this body? Or am I this body? Or is this body mine? Is it not the temple, the instrument, given to me for my use? Look at my hands. Can they of themselves 
give or withhold? Or must I give or withhold? Just using the hands as an instrument in either case. Can my hands be benevolent? Can my hands be stingy, miserly? Have my hands the power to give or the power to withhold? Or is all that power in me? Are not my hands the instruments for my giving or my withholding? Does the heart give me permission to live? Or does my life function the heart? If my hands cannot give and cannot withhold, how then could my heart give life or withhold life? If my hands are not self-acting, how can my heart be self-acting, or liver, or lungs? or kidneys. Is there not something called I which functions through this body? Is there not something called I that walks the street through these legs or with these legs or by means of these legs? Is there not something called I that gives through these hands, or perhaps sometimes withholds through these hands. Is there not an I which functions through the instrumentality of this body? Where is this I? What is this I? Who am I? What am I? Now that I have seen this body in its true light, can I ever again look in a mirror and say, I look well or I look poorly? Or must I forever remember that we are now speaking of my body? The body is not you. The I that you are now realizing is you. I am I. I am not body. Body is not me. I am. Even if you cut off these legs, I still am. Cut off these arms. I still am. I am. I am being. My being is not dependent on body. My body is dependent on my being. The fact that I am being, the fact that I am, gives expression to my body. And the I that I am determines whether my hands shall give or withhold, whether my legs shall walk or be still. The I that I am functions my body. My body has no will of its own, no intelligence of its own, no action of its own. My body responds to me. My body responds to the I that I am. My body is governed by me. I say to my body, go thence and it goes. I say to my body, remain and it remains. I say to my body, sit and it sits. I 
I am a law unto my body. I am the life of my body. I am the soul and I am the substance of my body. The I that I am is me. The I that I am is the only me there is. What am I? Who am I? Where am I? Why am I? These questions each one must determine through meditation, introspection, cogitation, pondering the great truth of life. Who am I? Where am I? Why am I? What is my purpose? in life. Now that I know that I am I, body isn't I, body isn't me, I am I, I have at least an inkling of the great truth that I am eternal and that I even survive the body. The body cannot destroy me, but rightly understood, I can preserve the body. And even if some human belief were to destroy this body, I could raise it up again in three days because I am the governing agency of this body. I am the life of this body. I am the substance and I am the creator of this body. body is not a law unto me. I am a law. I am the law unto my body. I am the activity of my body. It moves according to my decree. Now do you see that part of the discourse of human experience have come from the belief that the body is me, or that I am the body, or that I am in the body, whereas I am infinite identity, eternal identity, immortal identity. As you close your eyes in meditation and just Realize the word I, 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 I really am, I am, I am being, I am being. Very, very soon you will begin to perceive the nature of the I that I am, and then you will see why Moses was shocked out of his skin when he realized I am that I am. Ah, everyone knew in those days, that is, the great scholars knew, that I am as God. Now Moses receives the great revelation, but I am that I am. Yes, there is only one I, one eternal immortal I, one eternal immortal ego. Whether that I appears as you or as me, as he or as she, it is that same I. Now then, the very moment that you realize that I am being, I am life eternal, I am really the law of being, the life of being, the soul of being, 
you begin to lose your fear of dying, of death. And the moment you begin to lose your fear of dying or of death, you begin to lose all of the ills of the flesh. Because all of the ills of the flesh are based on that original fear, on that major fear. I am being, and therefore I am eternal being. I am forever being. Nothing can ever stop the being that I am, because I exist independently of what the world calls matter, confinement embodiment. I am. I am not subject then to death, disease, sin, fear, because I am the law of being, the life of being. Because the nature of my being is eternality, nothing from without can enter to destroy. Now, There is no other teaching at the present time that stands exclusively and completely on the revelation of I as your being. And it is for this reason that whatever your background, somewhere along about this time, you have got to begin to outgrow it. Because now you must begin to see that you are not idea, you are not reflection, you are not manifestation, you are not effect, you are not image, you are not reflection, you are I. And all you have to do is say the word within yourself, I. And you know that you really are I. Anyone will try to tell you that you aren't I, you would be very quick to assert yourself. Of course you are I. And of course you would acknowledge I am. Never would you say I am dead. Never would you say I am unconscious. No, the only thing that you could truthfully say, and you would defend this to the death, yes, that I can see, I am. I exist. I am. I am being. I am not extinct. I am being. I am. I am life. And so, the very moment that you uh, realize I am, I is my true identity, then uh, you begin to have dominion over everything that's on earth, or in the air, or in the water beneath the earth. Now you begin to have your God-given dominion, because now you know I am. I eternally am. I immortally am. I is my true being. I is my true identity. I cannot get. I cannot acquire. I cannot achieve. I cannot grow. I cannot even grow in understanding. I can merely become aware of that which I am. Son, thou art ever with thee, and all that I have is thine. All of the life that I have. Many people think that refers only to inheritances, to lands or crops. Oh, no. Son, thou art ever with me. And all that I have is thine. All of my divine life is your divine life. All of my divine soul is your divine soul. All of the spirit, all of the soul that I am, thou art. All that I am, thou art. All that I have is thine. Not after you pray. Not after you give a treatment or get a treatment. Not after you reform. As a matter of fact, if you wait to reform, it'll be too late. It is now that I already am, and the reformation, if any is needed, comes about 
through the recognition that all that God is, I am. The place whereon I stand is holy ground. Why? Because I and the Father are one. And I am ever with the Father, and the Father is ever with me, so both of us are right here. And all that God is, I am, and all the Father hath is mine. That is why the psalmist said, If I make my bed in hell, thou art there, or, yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, thou art there. You see, it was only a shadow of death. It wasn't death, you know, it was a shadow. A shadow that looked like death, that appeared like death, but strangely enough, everyone who goes through the experience stands there watching themselves go through it. Because you never can get away from I, and I can't die. I can merely watch itself pass from infancy to youth and from youth to maturity and maturity to middle age and middle age to old age, if you permit it. But I will always be there observing it. Why should you think that I won't be there at 90 as well as 80 or 120 as well as 70? Oh yes, I will be there. I will be there watching every change of my body. I will be there watching every change of address. I will be there watching every change of expression. I will never leave me nor forsake me. I can't leave me or forsake me because I is me. Is there any God before me, says Isaiah? No, I know not any. No, I and me is one. So I will never forsake me. I will always be around watching me. I will always be there governing and protecting me, I will always be there acting as me, because I am is me. Now, gain that true idea of yourself, and you will see why in much of the religious literature of the world the word self is spelt with a capital S. There is but one selfhood. There is but one I. There is but one ego. There is but one being. Now, if there is but one I am that one, that was Moses' revelation. I am that one. I am that I am. And of course that was the foundation of all that the Master taught. He repeated the Mosaic teaching, I am that I am. Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me, for I and the Father are one. I am in the Father, and the Father is in me. I am in you, and you are in me, and we are in God, because God is our true identity. God is our true being. God is our selfhood. Ah, when you commence to realize that, there will be no fear of tomorrows. There will be no fear of bombs. There will be no fear of calendars. There will be no fear of disease, because I already am that I am. It is not to be achieved, it is to be realized. It doesn't have to be attained, it is to be realized. I already am all that God is, I already am. All that the Father hath is already mine. And so spiritual wisdom is not turning to God for anything. Is it not clear that the world has been turning to God for something for thousands of years and hasn't gotten it yet? Because there is no such God, nor is there anything to get. There is only the realization, uh, oh, I already am. Don't turn to God. Too many people have been trying it for too many generations. Realize what the truth of being is. I already am. All that I have been seeking, I am. All that I have been going to truth for, I already am. And all the truth can do for me is to reveal 
that I already am. And so you see, when you turn to God, you set up a sense of separation that prevents the demonstration. When the real turning to God is a turning to the truth, and the truth is, I and the Father are one. Now, once you realize that great truth, and in your meditation, with your eyes closed as a rule, you perceive the nature of I. You will come upon the next great mystery. This I that I am has form. This I that I am has permanent form, eternal form, harmonious form. It is not such a form as I can see with my eyes. Nevertheless, it is a form. It is a body. And the moment you perceive that, you begin to understand the great message of John. Your body is the temple of the living God, and it is a temple not made with hands not mortally conceived. Your body is eternal in the heavens, that is, eternal in time and space, eternal in life, eternal in spirit and in soul and in substance. I already am, and I am embodied the I that I am appears as form, not the form that I behold with my eyesight, but the form that I am aware of in meditation. Isn't it somewhere written, a form divinely fair? A form divinely fair. That is the form of our being. That is why it is possible at some moments of illumination to behold God because even God has form but not finite form not physical form but a form divinely fair a form of spirit a form of soul a form of activity a form of grace and of beauty and so have we, because I is that God, and I is made manifest as form, an eternal and an immortal form, a perfect and an harmonious form, and that is the I that I am. And so we see the truth about our identity, and about our body. Now we know my body is the temple of the living God. God made all that was made, and all that God made was made of God. Therefore it partakes of the very nature of God, eternality and immortality and perfection. God made my body in his, in its own image and likeness, in my own image and likeness. God made this form, this infinite divine form, and God made this form in the image of true being. To image forth, to show forth true identity, and therefore my body is a manifestation, an expression, an image or reflection of the I that I am. And all that I metaphysically was taught that I am is really the truth about my body, not about I, not about me. My body is an idea. My body 
is an image, a reflection, an expression. My body shows forth all that I am because my body is the I am formed. Formed spiritually, eternally, and immortally. I am true identity. I am eternal identity. I am God being. I am God being me. And my body is the temple, the instrument of my activity and of my living. This is the truth about my being, my true being, my true identity, my God being. And this is the truth about my body. And uh, this thought which is coming through me, this idea, this expression, this is the Holy Ghost, the Christ. This is the communion uh, between uh, God, my true identity, and my body. This is the inner communion uh, with God. This is my inner communion or Holy Ghost with God. I really am all that God is. I am. And uh, my body shows forth this infinite harmony and perfection of that which I am. And it eternally shows forth that which I immortally and eternally am. And this truth which I am declaring is my communion, is my inner at one is my inner recognition of attunement. So we have God and body, and then we have Christ, the revelator of the truth about God and body. Christ the revelator, Christ the attunement or at one Christ the communion, that which reveals the oneness of I, my true being, my true identity, and my eternal form. Christ is the revelator. Christ is the comforter. This is the great comforter. This communion, the secret of my true identity and of my immortal being and body, this is the true comforter. This has come to be with us forever. Forever means uh, not until death do us part. This comforter has come to be with us forever and there is no other comforter. There is no other truth that can remain with us forever because there is no other truth that will give us life everlasting. There is no other truth that will let us live forever except the truth that I am the truth. Except the truth that I am divine being. Except the truth that I am immortal and eternal now. Only that truth can be a comforter forever for only that truth can reveal the foreverness of our life. As against this spiritual truth, there is that form which we see in a mirror. There is that which we call the expressions of nature, trees, flowers, vegetables, fruits. These are not the spiritual being or body. These are the concepts that we humanly entertain of being and body. No one has ever seen a potato because a potato is spiritual. And a potato can only be seen with a spiritual consciousness. What we behold as a potato is our concept of potato. No one has ever seen a rose or an orchid. 
These are spiritual entities. These are forever identities in the divine consciousness which I am. And I can behold them only in my period of inner communion and illumination. But what I behold with my eyes represents a concept of these realities. Now, it is for this reason that any attempt through spiritual work to change these concepts outside, any attempt to reduce fevers or remove lumps must inevitably result in failure. Why? Because after you've changed the concept, all you've got is an improved concept. You still are not dwelling in or with reality. Even if you could make an empty uh, orchard full one, you still have attained nothing. Because tomorrow it can be empty again. Even if you could restore every physical body on earth to health, you're doing nothing because the next day most of them are going to be sick with something else, or at least they're going to be a day older. That is why, even if we could walk around with a magic wand and tell everybody in the hospitals to jump up and walk, it would accomplish nothing. That is why many of the healings that we give to our friends and relatives are meaningless, have no value, because all we've done is change a state of ill health into one of good health for them, and we leave them right the same place in consciousness to go and get sick again tomorrow, and sometimes we make life very difficult for them, because we have emptied them out of one era in order to make room for seven more to come in. We have given them a physical, healthy body so that now they can go out and get it into seven times more devilment. Whereas if they were left in their sick body or sinful body, they too could do as we are doing, evolve out of it through a change of consciousness. You see, the only permanent health and the only per permanent wealth that can come to us is through evolving out of our present state of consciousness into the higher or true state of consciousness. If a man were living by theft and you gave him a life income, you would not stop him being a thief even though he never stole anything anymore. You haven't changed his consciousness. You really made it unnecessary for that consciousness to operate, for the time being at least. If you could restore health to everybody on the face of the earth, you would be doing nothing for them except giving them a little temporary painlessness. But, if through this truth you can change the consciousness of an individual so that it evolves into the realization of its true nature and being, then the thief says, how foolish to steal when all that the Father hath is already mine and all I have to do is stay in bed until somebody brings it to my back door and unloads it for me. Just wait, wait, patiently wait, as Burroughs has told us, and it will come to us. It will come to us. It has to come to us. It has to come to us. There's no other way. There is no other way. If, if we can be patient, if we can be patient. Do I have that here? I hope. This is John Burroughs. Many of you are familiar with it. Serene, I fold my hands and wait, nor care for wind, nor tide, nor sea. I rave no more against time nor fate, for lo, my own shall come to me. I stay my hands, I make delays, for what avails this eager pace? I stand amid the eternal ways, and what is mine? shall know my face. Asleep, awake, by night or day, the friends I seek are seeking me. No wind can drive my bark astray, nor change the tide of destiny. What matter if I stand alone? I wait with joy the coming years. My heart shall reap 
where it has sown and garner up its fruit of tears. The waters know their own and draw the brook that springs in yonder height. So flows the good with equal law unto the soul of pure delight. The stars come nightly to the sky, the tidal wave unto the sea, nor time nor space nor deep nor high can keep my own away from me. Serene I fold my hands and wait, whatever the storms of life may be. Faith guides me up to heaven's gate, and love shall bring my own to me. Ah, you see, it is ever so that all that God is I am, and the moment that I rest and relax in that truth, I give to God the divine love, the opportunity to let flow to me that which is mine, but that which I have blocked by attempting myself to get it, to achieve it, to acquire it. You see, the word I there becomes a devil. The I that seeks, the I that tries, the I that strives, the I that is a go-getter, the I that is a planner and a schemer, that I interferes with the I that I am, bringing me my own. There's no need for that word I in our vocabulary. The I that strives, the I that seeks, the I that does. There's only room in our being for the I that is. The eye that recognizes that all that God has is mine. That all that God is, I am. That eye then rests serene. Waits. And lets life reveal itself. Lets God disclose itself. Lets the harmony of eternal being appear. But you see, mental work prevents that. Mental work stops all the divine forces from operating. In our experience, it doesn't stop the divine forces operating because they're always operating for those with open consciousness. But they surely stop them operating in our experience. The moment I attempt something, the moment I desire something. I have said in some of our recent classes, desire is sin. Many of you wonder why I say that when Mrs. Eddy has said that desire is prayer. Well, of course, Mrs. Eddy was right. Because when Mrs. Eddy said desire is prayer, she assumed that you knew that she meant desire for God is prayer. Above all people, she knew well that desire for automobiles or houses or marriages or divorces or children was not prayer. She knew that the only one true desire is a desire for God. That desire is prayer. A desire for an awareness of God. For a realization of God. A desire to know God, whom to know aright is life eternal. That desire is prayer, but all other desire is sin. The desire for a home and the desire for marriage and the desire for companionship, and the desire for children, and the desire for harmony, and the desire for beauty, all of this is sin. Why? Because in the fulfillment of one's desire for God, all these things are added unto us. And the attempt to acquire them without the acquisition of God is and constitutes the sin. Someone somewhere said, if you had God and nothing else, or oh, if you had uh, all, if you had God and all there is in the world, and if you had only God and nothing else in the world, you would have the same. Yes, because God is all inclusive. And so, to acquire God, to attain Godhood, to attain Christhood, 
To attain the realization and demonstration of God means the attainment and demonstration of all there is. But to seek even one thing separate and apart from God is sin. It's a sense of separation. That is why metaphysics has failed in the degree that it has failed. Only those who have succeeded with it, who have seen through its higher spiritual light to the realization that one must seek God alone. All others who are still demonstrating supply, demonstrating place, demonstrating position, demonstrating a practice, demonstrating a student body, they must all ultimately fail even though some, through willpower, will have a temporary success. But in the end, all must fail, because there is no such thing as a permanent demonstration except the demonstration of Christhood, in which all things are included. Now, let us remember this, because of our various metaphysical backgrounds. From this moment on, I am. I am being. I am life eternal. I am true being. Thou seest me, thou seest the Father that sent me. For I and the Father are one. All that God is, I am. All that the Father hath is mine. Number two. My body is the image and likeness of me. My body is the manifestation of me of the I that I am. 